All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, go ahead and get your laptops out. Start pulling these Docker images. The repo is, again, dcos-labs slash secure-mesos-workshop. Uh, they're large Docker images. You want to get them early before everybody else steals your Wi-Fi. And yeah, I'll hand it over to Vishnu. Uh, my name is Adam Bordelon. I work at Mesosphere, uh, Mesos committer, DCOS committer, all kinds of things. Uh, it's my fourth Mesos con, so I've been doing this a while. Uh, yeah, that's kind of like me. Uh, I am me at apache.org, and Jurg is our uh, track lead. He'll be around to help you with the workshop during uh, the exercise time as well. And Vinod will be joining us shortly, uh, one of the original Mesos committers and contributors. Uh, worked at Twitter there for a while, is now uh, managing the Mesos core team at Mesosphere. And we've got Vishnu. I work in sales. <laughs> All right, so um, actually, this is actually a, a continuing conversation from anybody that was at MesosCon 2016, where Adam actually put together a, uh, a Mesos security best practices talk. So there's been a couple of uh, improvements, obviously, over the course of a year in Mesos security. Um, we're trying to address most of the topics that are still relevant, but also introduce a couple of uh, new topics. So for those of you just uh, trickled in after we got started or are just arriving, uh, all of the slides, all of the content, the README, um, and all the, the link to the Docker images that you need to download are available at this URL. Uh, the slides should also be up on the Sketch site. I think you're good uploaded it, so if you've got your schedule open, it should be there too. All right, great. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's a continuing discussion, um, and I be, I'm constantly surprised by my interactions on Slack, the community mailing lists, so on and so forth. When people come to us and you know ask us for advice on how they should be running their Mesos cluster by, by saying, I suddenly find myself running a Bitcoin miner on my cluster, what do I do? Um, so this, is, this has happened more often, and, and some of you may laugh at this, but there's plenty of people out there um, that are getting owned. Um, and especially given what's happened at Equifax and uh, how it's affected almost everybody. I don't think it's not affected. Uh, there's nobody that's unaffected by it. Um, we want to make sure that you try to the best of our knowledge you know, to set up a cluster um, that is somewhat relatively tolerant to most known attack vectors. Um, and again, uh, I personally work with a lot of customers. Uh, we have you know, customers in financial services, healthcare, government, you name it. Um, and they're all handling very, very sensitive data and very important data that uh, you know, affects our lives. So, um, and a lot of this stuff is running on Mesos uh, as of late. And we're trying to make sure that uh, they understand the implications. This talk is still very introductory at the end of it. And even at the end of the labs, it's only scratching the surface of what we really need to uh, put together for Mesos. Uh, and all of the components around it. In fact, there's a lot of things that are out of scope and we won't be able to get to them. But if you have any questions on, any pointed questions that are not covered by this talk uh, between Adam and the rest of the crew here, uh, I'm pretty sure we can answer most of that. So um, the, the other things that are sort of interesting is, you know, over the past year at least, we've enabled a lot of primitives that enable better multi-tenancy. I know it's an overloaded term. But uh, we'll try and qualify what we mean by multi-tenancy, at least in this realm. Um, but in general, it's like, let's try and prevent all of the easy mistakes from happening, is really what this talk is about. Um, stuff that's out of scope. I mean, container security, again, is a very, very broad topic. Um, a lot of the, the very specific things about the container riser uh, security is covered in this uh, Mesos ticket 4936. So I'm not going to talk about mandatory access controls at the Linux kernel level or capabilities or seccomp or user namespaces. They all have their role to play and they all need to work really closely together. And there's still gaps in what we can support today and do support today as it relates to you know, other containerizers like Docker and so on. So um, but just, just quickly, uh, Mesos does have capability support. Seccomp is a work in progress. User namespaces is notoriously difficult. Uh, so getting this design right uh, is something that's going to take us and everybody else 
uh, a lot more time. Uh, and again, we're gonna talk about like hardware security primitives. I mean, if you're really using something like uh, a TPM, a tr trusted platform module, or a hardware security module like an HSM for key management, or you know, other sort of credentials or secret management, you know, I'm gonna talk about that. Okay, so uh, where do we start, right? So let's make sure we fence off the outer boundary of the Mesos cluster. That's what securing the perimeter is all about. Like, you know, make sure everything is, you shouldn't be able to access, let's say, you know, the port 5050 on your Mesos master. You shouldn't be able to access 8080 or 8443 on Marathon, for example, by default. So, uh, at least from the outside world. And the outside world being some sort of threat vector. So, what are we talking about, right? So, we have a whole bunch of Mesos components. We have, you know, potential actors like a framework developer or user. We have these service users. They don't really necessarily care that stuff is running on DCOS. And finally, have the actual operators or admins of the DCOS cluster, right? How do we stitch together all of these sort of components and building blocks together and arrive at something that's, you know, out of the box, a little more secure than the default? Uh, we all know that the masters uh, listen on port 5050, as it's shown. There's also 2181 on there, which is the Zookeeper, and securing Zookeeper is very, very difficult, if not impossible. It doesn't do TLS yet, and the best technology that we have for Zookeeper is ACLs. So, which is also why at the start of uh, the keynote we mentioned getting rid of Zookeeper is actually a pretty big priority, right? It's very hard to secure. It's got, it solved a problem for a lot of people, including us, for a very long time, but we're quickly running up against its limitations pretty badly, and uh, hopefully we can get rid of it um, and replace it with something that's actually secure as well. Um, the agents listen on port 5051, and then you have... Uh, I wanted to introduce this concept of a public agent, which is uh, a special class of agents, which is usually going to be used for ingress traffic. So we don't want anything directly being able to like, you know, communicate with your agents, ideally, directly. Um, instead, we're going to proxy all these communications through a limited subset of nodes that are going to be sitting in like a DMZ environment. And that's this notion of a public agent. So that's why I put AD and 443 there. You're typically going to run some sort of proxy. HA proxy, Nginx, something like that, and then have that talk to your actual services running on the private agents, and it's all filtered through a firewall. So let's start with just the Mesos uh, security. I know this is kind of like in interesting to watch. So uh, effectively, what this is trying to say that almost all communications traverse through a firewall. Um, if the master wants to talk to a private agent, technically it should go through a firewall. Uh, the public agent talking back to a private agent, so, so on and so forth, they should technically go through a firewall. but uh, what this also means is that each of these things are in different network domains or network zones, right? You have a network zone for your public agents, you have a network zone for your public, uh, private agents, and your masters, which is the control plane, should also be in a different zone. And then the firewall sits between the zone and you're routing traffic back and forth and only permitting you know, the, the ports that actually matter for this communication to work, right? But in practice, it turns out that you know, it's more of a free-for-all. Um, you really want a lot more permissive access between the masters and the agents and between the public agent and the private agent. And more specifically from the, private from the public agent to the private agent, yeah. Because your applications are actually running on your private agents. So in practice, it's actually harder to secure this communication, which is why this entire thing is uh, in, in, a, in a specific boundary. And now if you introduce the, the administrators, they will go through a firewall, so they will only access port, eight, port 5050, for example, on the masters. But that again, uh, we aren't talking about authentication yet, but just, this, just the port security at this point. Uh, and this itself will, will, will help you a lot, because at this point, only the master is accessible. You typically don't want your agents directly accessible, right? You want to go through something else. I'll get to that later. Um, so now throw in the developers or the framework users, the people that use Marathon. Uh, welcome, Vinod. Uh, so, and, and, and now these are the people that are actually using uh, frameworks, or developing frameworks, or writing frameworks, or you know, using Marathon. So even they need to go through a separate set of firewalls to make sure that they are only accessing the services that, that they should technically be accessing on the ports that they should be accessing. So uh, I've also introduced the load balancer here, and I didn't mention this in the previous slide, but this is uh, in any typical highly available environment. You've got to have multiple masters, multiple uh, agents. Uh, and in this case, even the frameworks is going to be at least two or three, depending on your level of availability. So there's, there's a load balancer involved as well. And finally, uh, we have this third class of users. The, the, the people are just like trying to connect to the service that's being hosted by uh, your Mesos uh, cluster. And they don't necessarily talk to any of the administrative infrastructure. They shouldn't even know about the control plane. Ideally, they shouldn't even know that's running on Mesos, right? 
They only want to talk to you know, whatever it is, that Tomcat application or whatever. And that goes through a separate set of firewalls and load balancers, and they only talk to the public agents. So you're restricting the, the sort of uh, attack vector at this point. Does it make sense so far? OK, very simple stuff. But this is the kind of things that will prevent you, know, you getting owned by a Bitcoin or Ether miner. Don't wake up one morning and find that running on your cluster. Um, there's another important thing that, you know, we have this in DCOS, but it's a nice pattern to also include. Uh, we call this a service gateway, proxy, whatever you want to call it, but um, effectively it's something like an Nginx that sits in front of all of this um, that provides user-friendly routes, effectively. So when I want to access my Mesos masters, I would just say, go to this host name, you know, whatever, uh, gateway.mycluster.com slash Mesos, and it'll take me to the Mesos UI. If I go to slash agent, that's also a proxy by which I can actually get to the agent UI, more specifically the sandbox logs, right? You don't want the sandbox logs directly exposed over a, an open network so you can attack the, the agents that way. So this is still a nice thing to introduce in between, uh, which will help complete the picture both from a usability perspective and also it does improve the security of the platform because you're forcing everything to now enter, just like we did for the HA proxies on the public agents, uh, a finite set of elements that you tightly control and lock down. So that's really what the service gateway is for. Okay. Uh, Obvious things that everybody should be using by now. It is 2017. It should be TLS, not SSL. Um, please use TLS and, 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 and modern versions of the, the protocol. So um, some people still use the words interchangeably, but yeah, SSL is dead. Uh, we still use the environment variables. Uh, that they, 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 they're called SSL, but as you can see, there's, there's TLS involved. Um, so uh, very specifically, uh, by default, Mesos does not build with TLS support. So if you're going to build your own Mesos or roll your own Mesos, make sure you compile it with those flags. Uh, you need to use libevent. And basically, this is wrapping uh, OpenSSL libevent, libevent OpenSSL, one of those libraries. So yeah, this is, this is effectively required for you to even enable TLS support for Mesos by default. It's not built that way. Um, unless you know, you're using one of our uh, the, the Mesos official binaries, which now, by default, include TLS. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of variables. I mean, but the important ones are, yes, you want it to be enabled, right? So this downgrade thing is also very dangerous. I mean, you typically don't want to have, once you've enabled a TLS connection, to go back to insecure uh, connections. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Just, for upgrades. Just for upgrades. So yeah, so we will always want to like, make sure that if you are trying to connect over an insecure and non TLS connection, we want to upgrade you up to TLS and say, no, no, no I want you to connect with TLS. Um, obviously, for any TLS communication, you need a key file, a cert file, and um, you want to verify your certificates. We don't, we're not doing mutual authentication of the master and the agent or whatever is communicating over TLS at the moment, but it does help you verify the chain of trust if you actually, say, require cert. So this is a nice feature to have. So you, and, and this actually effectively makes it more strict. So you need verify and require. Require implies verify. So that's what's happening there. Um, uh, other things, um, uh, I really like using the certificate authority. I mean, so in the labs, what we're going to ending up going to do is we're going to spin up like self science certs, snake oil certs. Um, this is not what you should be doing in production. Uh, you really want to be using a proper CA. Um, but if you want to get started, at least the communication is over TLS and not in plain text. So that's really what this is about. Use proper ciphers. Uh, I know people care about the version, so please try to be on at least 1.2. 1.1 uh, is still around. 1.0 should not be used. It is deprecated. Uh, so even an SSL v3, if anybody enables that, you should fire them. So don't do that. Um, and then, yeah, you can also pick the kind of curves that you want to use. If you're really particular, if you have like very finite uh, security requirements, you can also do that. OK, so this is a CA structure. Um, and you could set it up any which way. Most organizations that I've run into have uh, a root CA, which is completely offline. There is no way to get to it. Uh, it's usually an HSM. It's very expensive stuff. Um, and then what they instead do is have online intermediary CAs, to which there's usually an API attached if you're actually a savvy customer and you don't want to kill somebody. Um, because Generating certs with the CSR, getting it signed, getting it back, there really should be an API for it. There's toolkits out there like CFSSL from Cloudflare, um, which is what we use inside DCOS, for example. But really, it should be an API-driven thing. Um, it's got another problem that I won't cover yet, but which is you know, if somebody submits a CSR to this API, why should I sign it? Right? 
why should I give it back? We're not going to talk about that problem specifically. But usually the intermediaries can be tiered. So you can actually have at the very top, you have this you know, intermediary CA for, let's say, the servers. You have an intermediary CA for all of the application certs. And then you could also distribute uh, and have another intermediary, uh, second tier intermediary CA for region specific certs. It's, it's rare to see more than uh, an intermediary, or at least usually the, the first levels of what I see with the offline route at the top. But uh, I've also seen the, the pattern depending on how sophisticated the customers are. And finally, you issue certs for each of these things, and then you have TLS. So, um, and that's the, the open-ended item, which is how do I actually get this you know, key insert? How do I generate the key insert? Um, and then get this certificate signed. So, and then finally, we also have framework schedulers that also need to talk to the Mesos masters over TLS. How do we get search for that? How do we secure that communication? How do we give the scheduler the private key and the, the certificate as well to, to bootstrap itself? Those are all problems that we're going like, to you know, hand wave at this point. Come talk to us about some strategies that we've employed. There's, there's, there's different kinds of strategies for each of these things. Uh, very simply, uh, how would we do this? I, I really like the CA APIs, but um, uh, the only one thing I want to make sure is uh, most people have APIs, actually uh, CFSSL has this, where you can ask it to generate the private key on the server itself. Usually that's a bad strategy. Uh, you really want to keep the private key completely only on the entity that's generating or requesting a cert. That's really what I want to show here. So either if you're a master or an agent or a scheduler, make sure the private key doesn't unnecessarily move across the network. That's really what that's about. So you generate a private key pair, the public key, private key, uh, generate a CSR, submit the CSR to the certificate authority for signing. If it's valid and it's an open-ended question, why should I give you a, a certificate back for your CSR? Um, assuming we're taking the, the short route here, um, we'll get a valid signed certificate and we're off to the races. Otherwise, we get an error. So I'm gonna leave that open for now. Any questions so far? Make sense? Yeah, TLS is important. Um, I'll hand it over to Adam for modules. All right, so modules themselves are not specifically a security feature, uh, they, but they enable us to plug in dynamic uh, functionality uh, via shared libraries, which gives us a few different benefits. Uh, one is you can isolate external dependencies if there's a, you know, some complex SASL or something that you don't want to bundle into Mesos itself, you can put that in a module and then have that loaded dynamically. You also don't have to recompile all of these things separately. So the modules can be compiled separately from the, the core Mesos. Uh, and this has enabled you know, people to experiment. You know, grad students can go take Mesos and inject their own functionality for allocators or whatever else. It also has enabled companies like Mesosphere to build our own proprietary implementations of uh, authenticators, authorizers, that we can plug into our distribution of Mesos. Uh, and we, as Apache Mesos uh, committers and the community, we've built out uh, module injection points and hooks into various aspects of the master API and lifecycle, the agent API, uh, various different points in the uh, container launch and destroy lifecycle. Uh, there are, yeah, many different module types. So the allocator uh, was one of the earliest ones. Uh, we long talked about how it was pluggable, but once we introduced Mesos modules, uh, we actually made it pluggable. So you can build your own implementation, get rid of DRF if you want, experiment with something new. Uh, I, there are companies that have worked with that uh, for their own particular frameworks and workloads. Uh, there's authentication, uh, which you know, we'll talk quite a bit more about today. And uh, we won't actually show you how to build your own authenticator module or authenticate -y authenticator module today, but uh, it's not too hard. Uh, reach out to us and we can walk you through the process uh, offline. Uh, authorizer as well, for which you know, we like to separate authentication, which is just validating the identity from authorization of what is this identity allowed to do. And so you can swap out either of those independently or both of them. Uh, secrets is another thing that you know, we previously used some generic module and modules and hooks for the Mesos containerizer and the Docker containerizer, but recently have added uh, secret generator and resolver modules so that secrets are becoming first class in, in Apache Mesos. 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Isolator, which was the very first module that we uh, introduced. And it's a bit of a misnomer now. Originally, it was the idea that, OK, you can have custom behavior. You have some resource that you want to isolate. Uh, and you know, before a container launches, you do some setup. While it's running, you do some monitoring. When it dies, you clean up. And then it turns out that that's just generically useful to have these hooks into the container lifecycle. Uh, so we've used that for many different things, injecting secrets before you start the container, uh, modifying environment variables, setting up uh, you know, new file systems. Uh, you can do all kinds of things with an isolator. So if a lot of times when partners and customers say, oh, I want to inject some custom functionality in Mesos, we say it's probably going to be an isolator module. Uh, we also have uh, modularized the master contender and detector, which is what's putting us on the path towards getting rid of Zookeeper. Uh, so rather than using Zookeeper for uh, leader election, you could swap this out for etcd, console, text files, I don't know, whatever you want to do. Uh, we have modules for container loggers and uh, QoS controllers and resource estimators, which is uh, used for oversubscription. Any questions on modules? All right. Uh, you want to cover authentication? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think everybody knows what authentication means. Um, so effectively verifying the identity of something, right? That you're authenticating to be who you are. So in Mesos, uh, we want to make sure that frameworks can be authenticated. We don't want a rogue Spark framework logging in and consuming all of your resources, for example. So we want to make sure that those frameworks are authenticated. So you have a principle which identifies this framework that you know, presents some sort of cred credential and says, hey, I am who I am. I know something about, uh, or you also know something about me that makes me authenticated, and now I can launch your tasks. So that's really what framework authentication is. We also want to make sure that we don't have rogue agents joining the Mesos cluster and trying to subvert resources or tasks away to it. So you can actually have a, a task that launches on a rogue agent, and now you can perhaps slurp a secret away. So that's one other measure that we have. And finally, in, in, in even with operating or interacting with all of the various HTTP endpoints, the, all the API endpoints that we have, and the operator endpoints that we have, uh, we also want to make sure that's authenticated. We don't want somebody saying, go and tear down a node or tear down a framework without the, the requisite privileges. So that's uh, the three types of authentication that we have. Uh, Mesos, by default, does ship with uh, an authentication module that uses uh, CRAM MD5 authentication. We'll get into some of these details in the lab. Um, we also can use GSS API for interacting with Kerberos because all of this is based on the Cyrus SASL library, simple authentication and security library. I think that's what it's called. Okay, so the next thing is, yeah, so what is it that, that allows this thing to work? We have to present a credential, like I mentioned before, which consists of a principle. Principle is this uh, term in Mesos, which is kind of used for identifying what your subject is, like what is your framework has a principle, right? That's what identifying that hey, I'm Spock principle foo or whatever. Um, and then this is going to present a, a secret, which in which in combination becomes the, the credential. And then if the credential validates, I am allowed to register the framework, uh, register as a framework and launch tasks. That's effectively what's going on. Um, authorization is the twin of uh, authentication. So once I've proven who I am, what am I allowed to do, right? So it's very, usually most people are familiar with ACLs. ACLs typically operate uh, with a subject an action and an object, right? So there is something trying to perform some action on some object, and that, that, that triple effectively becomes an ACL, right? So we'll see examples of an ACL in action, um, and we'll put together both the authentication and the authorization to allow certain kinds of tasks to launch or not launch based on uh, the, the ACLs. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's, uh, the reason I put this up here is actually because when I first started at Mesosphere two years ago, we maybe had four or five actions, and over the course of two years, a whole bunch of other authorizable actions have been added. So you can see that I think the, the one of the first ones was register frameworks and teardown frameworks, um, and then a whole bunch of other stuff got added. And this is what we were talking about earlier, right? In order to access the sandbox of your task, for example, we want to make sure that only, you know, people who are authorized to access the sandbox uh, are allowed to access the sandbox and so forth. Um, 
this is a diversion. It's not directly related to, to, to Mesos, but uh, it's a very useful concept, namespaces. You might have seen this in other, uh, in other I guess, orchestrators or uh, security systems in general. It's kind of like a nice way of organizing uh, your mental model of how you should uh, manage permissions. Um, it's in Cloud Foundry. It's not really uh, completely fleshed out in Kubernetes, but if you've used Cloud Foundry or something like that, namespaces exist there. Um, usually, this is an easier way of looking at how we can do things because it's a mental map directly to how organizations end, end up being. So at the very first tier, I like to segregate them out by environment. So you have a developer environment, test environment, production environment. And then your business units and project structure starts to overlay on top of that. And the reason for this is to reduce the uh, ACL explosion, really. So if you have, for example, you know, 10 tasks right, under some hierarchy, instead of giving you know, 10 ACLs, you can basically say at, uh, at the sales level, imagine sales runs 10 different kinds of tasks. You can basically assign an ACL at that higher level and not avoid and avoid completely having to write very, very specific ACLs for everything. So it kind of helps with the ACL reduction. And this is where you would apply permissions, right? So you basically say a developer working in sales cannot have any permission to tasks running under the eng uh, org, for example. So that's one way of looking at this. And I wanted to mention this because one of the ways we do uh, secrets authorization is directly mapped onto the namespace. So it's actually a one-to-one -one map. So if I have a secret uh, in that namespace, for example, dev secret, um, we'll, we'll see how that actually like, allows you to access a particular secret. Yeah. That's a great, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the question is, is there any mapping of these namespaces onto the hierarchical roles uh, that Ben H. mentioned this morning? Uh, the answer is that <clears throat> right now, namespaces are purely a DCOS concept. Uh, Mesos doesn't know about them, but in DCOS, we are planning to tie hierarchical roles to namespaces that we use for authorization. Uh, the hierarchical roles are specifically about uh, namespacing the resources and which frameworks are subscribed to particular roles in the hierarchy to be offered those resources. Uh, these namespaces are used for uh, once you've launched a task, the task then exists in a namespace, and you can control ACL, have ACLs that control who can access which tasks based on a namespace uh, definition that, so you can specify you have access to everything under sales without having to specify each individual one. And then secrets are also tied into that, so you can say this secret is available to any tasks under sales, uh, which I think you have a slide for that. Yeah, so. It's a little complicated to visualize it here, but uh, you can think of it as, uh, in DCOS at least, that the, a secret has a, a path, and it's a, the secret is shared with any tasks under the namespace that the secret lives in. So a secret that's at the top level is essentially shared with everything. So it's not really secret. Uh, a secret that is under like dev sales secret is accessible to dev sales app or dev sales foo slash bar slash whatever slash app, but is not available to dev slash app. Oh. Fano, do you want to talk about more about uh, the first classing of secrets in Apache Mesos? Okay, uh, yeah, this is a bit hard to see. Um, can we just uh, zoom on the top part? Yeah, I think that should be good. Okay, um, so what we did with secrets in the latest release of Mesos 1.3 was trying to make it more understandable to Mesos core. Uh, previously, most of the efforts for trying to deal with secrets were done using modules, um, 
an out of band hooks an out of band knowledge uh, but we wanted to have a first class concept in mesos that properly understands uh, secrets and make sure it's properly propagated to all the endpoints that are needed um, so what that means is um, we we introduced uh, uh, two different interfaces in mesos for handling secrets the first interface is uh, the secrets volume isolator uh, and the environment isolator so we added two new isolators uh, first class isolators into mesos and both of these isolators are responsible for um, taking a secrets object which is also a new primitive in mesos that we added uh, it's a new protob of message um, so given that secret message both these isolators are going to set up either an environment that uses uh, the secret that wants to access the secret value or um, or for apps that want to access the secret value as a file so these isolators you could use them to actually um, inject the secrets into your container basically as a as an environment or a, as a file and we also added a new interface called secrets uh, resolver that's right up there uh, so what this does is it's essentially an interface that allows you to hook into your secret backend. For example, if you have something like a vault um, and you're storing that uh, all your secrets data in vault and you want to be able to access that data from vault and give them access to your environment or file-based secrets, you could actually implement this resolver interface to talk to whatever backend your organization uses to store the secrets. Um, so this is a resolver that gets called whenever uh, these isolators realize that there is a secret in play. They're going to talk to the resolver to resolve a secret. So there's a secret name that you give in the secret proto, and the way to resolve that name to a value is done by the resolver. And you could write modules for whatever backends you have for the secrets. Um, in DCOS Enterprise, we wrote a backend um, we wrote a resolver to deal with the vault backend, but you could uh, definitely write it for whatever other backends you have. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, do you have anything else to say? I just want to comment that in <clears throat> Apache Mesos, we have support for secrets, not just to inject them into your container in a file or an environment, but also uh, image pull secrets. So if you needed to pull a an image from a private Docker registry, you can configure your task with an image pull secret that would have the credentials to access that private registry and pull particular images, and then that secret is not even injected anywhere into the container, so the container doesn't have access to it, but Mesos is given that to retrieve the image. And, um, I think in the future, we're probably also going to leverage this to um, fetch URIs that are behind authenticated endpoints, uh, like your S3s or HDFSs. Right now, we do not support any authentication for them, or there needs to be some hacks uh, outside the Mesos system to give them the credentials. But ideally, we would like to use the secrets uh, primitives to basically get and fetch artifacts in remote locations. Cool. Yeah, and I just want to point out, this is an example where you know, as Mesosphere, we took advantage of modules to experiment with the secrets functionality and play around with what would solve the problems for our customers. And then once we'd come up with a good system, we generalized it and pushed it back into Apache Mesos to make it available to the rest of the community. Rather than us throwing hacks into Apache Mesos and ripping it out and changing the APIs over and over again, we have room to experiment and then provide a stable API to the community. Uh, so, Next, we're gonna be doing the lab. Uh, so if you brought a laptop, uh, we're gonna ask you to go to the GitHub repo. Uh, it is dcos-labs slash secure Mesos workshop. And if you did not pull down the Docker images at the beginning of the talk, this is a good time to get started. So it could take you a little while. Uh, Wi-Fi is pretty slow, but hopefully most of you have already downloaded the images, and you'll be able to get started really quickly. Uh, so, all right, good. Most of you have downloaded the images. So that means the Wi-Fi should be lightning fast for the rest of you. Uh, 
So just a general overview of what this exercise is. Uh, we have Docker images uh, provided by Mesosphere for Mesos Master and Mesos Agent. Uh, we're using RC5 of the latest um, Mesos 1.4. So going to be voted in any day now. And uh, so you get to play with the latest and greatest. What we're going to do is have you start a master and an agent, and then we'll use the uh, Mesos execute scheduler that comes along with Mesos. Uh, so you can, we'll start out with a completely insecure default master and agent. They connect no SSL, TLS, uh, no authentication or anything like that. And you'll run the Mesos execute command, which registers a scheduler and launches a task and then exits. Uh, and then there are different steps of the ex exercise where we'll enable encryption on the master and then the agent and then the scheduler and then the executor. We'll enable authentication between the agent and the master and authentication between the uh, Mesos execute scheduler and the master. Uh, you can also add ACLs for authorization. You can add HTTP uh, authentication. Uh, those are more left as a bonus points exercise uh, we, where we have not given you the solution ahead of time. In this repo, there you'll find uh, scripts. Uh, one that is just the default insecure, uh, launch, which starts a master and an agent, and then an insecure run command that will run the Mesos execute. Uh, we recommend you start with that, either make a copy or edit it directly, and uh, follow along with the tutorial to add the flags and environment variables and you know play around with the Mesos UI and the logs and the uh, and everything you can to see how you're securing it piece by piece um, yeah and uh, we also put in a secure uh, cluster start and secure run command that have all all of this is done already. If you just want to run that and then cheat and look at all the flags, uh, I know not all of you are excited about, uh, well, I hope that all of you are excited about walking through each of these exercises step by step. If not, you can cheat and go home early. Uh, any questions? We'll be running around helping you out. Just raise your hand and we'll, we'll come. Uh, and answer all of your questions. Um, and yeah, I guess we've got a lot of other talks and th events that we want to recommend. All our friends and family here at MesosCon. Um, and I, the, along with the slides, there's also links to papers that are, yeah, uh, references. And you know, we've got business cards. We've got stickers at the Mesosphere booth. Uh, Come talk to us, ask us anything you need to know.